about a week ago, I came across the following post on Twitter, which was giving away a free Ida Pro license by way of completing a binary challenge. This instantly caught my attention, not only because I could win a free Ida Pro license, but because I have previously been studying some binary exploitation, and I thought that this would be a good challenge for me to test my skills. Overall, the author gives us one hint on what to expect. Polish off your Linux heap skills. Heap skills, you say? Not too bad, I thought to myself. How hard can it really be? Well, as it turns out, it was way more complex than I expected it to be, and I ended up having a heap of new things to learn. Get it? Heap? Okay, I'll see my way out. Approximately two days after the initial challenge announcement, another Twitter post was made by the same author with a link to the binary, as well as a target hostname and port for us to exploit. Our goal here was to find a vulnerability in the binary, write an exploit, and compromise our target host, which contained a flag. To win, we needed to supply the author a screenshot of our host compromise along with a copy of our exploit code. Unfortunately for me, I didn't win but someone solved this challenge in 30 minutes. This made me think that the challenge couldn't be that hard, but I was wrong. Initially, it took me a few days to learn how to exploit the binary by doing research on my own. After I exploited the binary, I noticed that the author posted a tweet a few days before the challenge, which had a dead giveaway on the vulnerability we needed to exploit. But let's not worry about that and just dive into how I solved this challenge. To start, we need to download the binary and unpack it. Right away, we see that we have a binary called sex 760 baby heap. Since the original challenge is hosted remotely on a target server, I want to make sure that we can recreate that scenario. To do so, I'll be using SOCAT, which is a command line based utility that establishes two bidirectional byte streams and transfers data between them. Simply, what we are doing here is telling SOCAT to listen on port 5760 and whenever a connection to that port is established, we are to execute the baby heap binary and create a bidirectional data stream, allowing us to communicate with the binary remotely. We can then use netcat to connect to port 5760 on our local host to access the binary and see what we have to work with. Upon establishing a connection, we notice something of interest right away. The binary is requesting us to submit a proof of work, which for this case is a lowercase alphanumeric string such that when our string is hashed via the SHA-256 hashing algorithm, the last six bytes of the hash, hence the negative six in brackets, are equal to the random string requested by the server. Now, if you haven't competed in many CTF challenges, then you're probably unaware of what a proof of work is. Many of you who are seeing this for the first time might be thinking, is this a challenge? Are we supposed to find a vulnerability in the way the string is hashed? Or is there a certain buffer overflow in the input that we need to exploit? While those are good questions to ask, that isn't the case for a proof of work. Simply, a proof of work in CTFs follows the same basic principles as the proof of work used in cryptocurrencies. If you're unaware of what these are, a proof of work is simply a mathematical puzzle that requires computational power to solve. These puzzles can come in many shapes and sizes, but the most common are usually a hash function, where we need to find the input knowing the output, or an integer factorization, where we need to present a number as a multiplication of two other numbers. Overall, the point of these proofs of work is to defend against a denial of service attack, where script kitties or those with limited knowledge of exploitation might be randomly fuzzing the binary and utilizing unnecessary resources on the server, thus preventing others from solving the challenge. So is there a need for us to reverse engineer the binary to figure out how to solve this proof of work? Not really, but it would be good to see how long our string input needs to be. We already know that we need to submit a lowercase alphanumeric string that once hashed via SHA-256, the last six bytes of the hash will equal that of what is presented to us. Let's quickly open this binary in IDA 
and follow the main function till we find where the proof of work is generated. Inside the main function, we find a call to a single sub function called sub1b90, which houses the application's logic for generating the proof of work. At the top, we notice that the LEA or load effective address instruction is being called to load a lowercase alphanumeric string. We can also see that the time function is being called and passed into the SRAND function to behave as a seed for random. Looking a little lower into location 1BD8, we see that the random function is being called to randomly select a character from our previously loaded alphanumeric string. This loops around a few times and places the randomly selected character into EAX via the MoveZX instruction. This string is then shot to 56 hashed via the sub function called sub1ad0 and later returned to the application. Looking a little lower, we see that a string compare function is utilized to compare our hashed input to the generated proof of work. If the compare fails, the application returns nope and then exits. Otherwise, it returns back into the application and gives us access to some switch cases. Knowing this, we can write a simple Python script that will compute, or rather brute force, a lowercase alphanumeric string for us to match the expected output. To start, we will begin by importing some necessary libraries that we will need for this challenge. Specifically, Pwn Tools, which is a CTF framework and exploit development library, String, which will allow us to utilize string constants for lowercase letters and digits, Hashlib, which implements a common interface to many different secure hash and message digest algorithms, and finally, Iter Tools, which will be used to compute the Cartesian product of input iterables. Cartesian product, in simple terms, takes two sets and returns another set of tuples, or pairs, which, in our case, will be the alphanumeric string. Next, we will define a function called ComputePOW that will take in one argument called ChallengePOW, which will be the expected proof of work given to us by the binary. Inside this function, we will create a new subfunction called GeneratePOW, which takes in two arguments, a size argument and a characters argument. We can hard code these arguments right away, since this function will be used to generate our proof of work string. The size will be set to 5, like in the binary, and cares will take in a combination of a lowercase letter's constant and digits from 0 to 9. Inside the generate POW subfunction, we will write some code that will randomly generate a string of 5 characters for us. Below that, we will add some code for the compute POW function that will call the generate POW subfunction consistently return a new lowercase alphanumeric string. We will then hash the string via SHA-256 and compare the last 6 bytes of that to the expected proof of work. If the hashed string provided to us matches the expected output, we will return the string. Once we have those functions created, we can now create a main function which does the following. First, it will connect to the binary and read the expected proof of work. Then. The script will compute the string necessary to complete the proof of work. Once we have a valid string, we will submit that string to the binary. And finally, using the Pwn Tools library, we will request to gain an interactive session with the binary itself. With the Python script completed, we execute the binary again by using SOCAT to listen on port 5760. And finally, we execute our exploit. As you can see, after a few seconds, a valid proof of work is generated, and we gain access to the main portion of the binary where exploitation should take place. Perfect. With access to the binary, we can now start testing it to find vulnerabilities. Unfortunately for us, we quickly learn that the info, create, and delete options are restricted, and we need to log in for them to work. We can quickly try known credentials like admin admin or admin password, but these don't seem to work. Before we try anything too complicated, let's first try and see if these credentials are hard coded somewhere in the binary. We can do this by opening the binary in IDA and pressing Shift F12 to see all the strings. Darn, there's nothing there. Alright, with that, 
let's dig into the login function within IDA, which should be in subfunction 1910. Right away, we see the disassembly for the username and password inputs. If we look closely, we will see that two paths down, there's a string compare function. Right away, we know that the binary is generating some sort of password. So, how do we find this password? Easy. What we could do is set up a debugger and see what the password input is being compared to. We can then use that password to log in. I'll start by opening the binary in EDB and executing it. Since we need a valid proof of work, we can pause the execution of the program and repurpose our Python script to generate a valid POW string. Once we have a valid string, we continue the execution and enter our string. Inside the binary, we select option 1 and enter a random username. We'll use admin for this. Press enter and then pause the program's execution again. After pausing the program, we can enter a random password. Press enter and now we can finally step through the program to see what our password is being compared to. I decided to use F8 or a step over to step over function calls, which can lead us down rabbit holes. After a few steps, we see that our password is stored in the RBX and RSI register, and that our username is also being stored in the RDI register. If we keep pressing F8 to step over the program's execution, we will slowly begin to notice that a string is being generated within the RBP and R15 registers. After a few more steps, we get a wrong credentials prompt. If we look back into the R15 register, we will notice that we can now see a fully generated string, which should be our password. Since we have this password, let's update our exploit script to log into the binary with the username admin and the password that we just generated. Once done, let's test this exploit against our binary. Awesome. We were able to successfully log in, so we now know that the password is good. After exploring the application a little more, we notice that the info option returns the username provided in the login prompt. What's the chance that this contains a vulnerability, like a format string vulnerability? What happens if the username is something like %x, or %b, or even %p? If we use %p, can we leak pointer addresses? Let's try doing just that. When we try to log in with the username %p, 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 we see that our credentials are wrong. What? How can this be? I thought that we found the correct password. Is there a new password being generated on startup? That can't be it, because our password works with admin all the time. So, what's the chance that the password is created from the username? Hmm. The password for admin looks really odd. What's the chance that it's actually an MD5 hash of the username? Hey, look at that. We were right. The password is the MD5 hash of the username. Let's test this in the binary by entering a new username full of %p, get the MD5 sum of the username, and use it as the password. Awesome. It works. So, let's see what happens if we try to execute the info option. Look at that. We have a format string exploit and can leak addresses. But what are these addresses for specifically? What are they pointing to? We can quickly check this address by attaching GDB to the forked baby heap child process, which was created by SoCat. Using the ps command, we grab the process ID of the child process and pass that into GDB using the PID parameter. Once GDB is attached, we can check what the leaked address is pointing to. Interesting, it seems that this address is leaking the pointer to free hook. Why is that? Well, if you looked into IDA, you would notice that in the second switch statement, there is a LEA or load effective address instruction for free hook. And that address is what's being leaked. Now, you might be wondering, what is freehook? Well, freehook is a symbol exported from libc, which allows a user-defined function to be called when the free function call is used. The value of this variable is a pointer to a function that free uses whenever it's called. For example, an author can hook the free function call with freehook that whenever free deallocates the memory previously allocated by malloc, 
Another function can be called like printf to print out a debug statement or do something else. So, can we abuse this somehow to execute code? Yes, we can. But first we need to find a vulnerability that allows us to write arbitrary data to certain addresses. The author for the binary told us that we need to polish off our Linux heap skills. And seeing a free hook being used, I'm instantly assuming that there must be some kind of vulnerability in the way data is allocated on the heap when malloc is called. Let's play around with the create and delete options. I'm really interested in the delete option. Reason for this is that if we call free twice on the same value, it can lead to a memory leak. This is known as a double free vulnerability. When a program calls free twice with the same argument, the program's memory management data structures become corrupted and could allow a user to write values in arbitrary memory spaces. The corruption can cause the program to crash or, in some circumstances, alter the execution flow. So, let's create a small heap allocation that's 10 bytes in size and add some random data. Once done, let's see if we can free that. It seems that we are being asked for an index to free, so let's try one. Error. Oh, that's right. Arrays start at 0, not at 1. So let's try freeing 0. That works. But what happens if we try to free 0 again? Well, it seems the application just crashed. And if we look inside the SOCAT output, we see that a double free was detected in tcache. Alright, well our double free just crashes the application, which is no good for us. But we now know that tcache is being used. So what is tcache? Well, tcache is a heap management technique introduced after glibc 2.6, where its main purpose was to improve the performance of heap management. But while improving performance, it has abandoned a lot of security checks, so there are many new ways to abuse it. One known attack against tcache is something called tcache poisoning, where if we are able to overflow a heap allocation via malloc, we can overwrite a heap chunk address and initially execute code. But we don't have a way to overflow the heap. Or do we? We know that the create option allows us to specify a size for malloc, and then allows us to add data. What's the chance that there is a buffer overflow here? We can check for any buffer overflows by creating a new allocation with a size of 16 bytes and adding 16 random bytes of data. Now, let's do the same thing, but this time, Let's write more than 16 bytes of data. Huh, look at that. It seems to have completed successfully, but we also got an invalid choice error. Is this a heap overflow? Only one way to check. Let's attach GDB again to the baby heap child process and find out where the heap is by using the info proc map command. We see that the heap is at the following address. So let's inspect 100 bytes from the heap address and see what we have. Notice that in the address ending with E2B0, we have our first 16 byte allocation. And if we look below, we see our second chunk allocation, which should be 16 bytes. But we have 17 bytes written. Notice 0x45 in the last line. That's hex for E, which we wrote. So this is an off by one overflow. This vulnerability occurs if an author improperly calculates an offset to an array of data. For example, he starts at 1 instead of 0. Because we have this off by 1 byte vulnerability, we can attempt to overwrite our chunk size header in the heap. After overwriting the header, we free the chunk, which will place it in the free list for chunks of size xxx or whatever we overwrite it to. And since the chunk is in the free list, it will be used to serve the next malloc of the specified size. Using this, we are then able to overflow many bytes into the other heap chunks. But before we can exploit this, we need to better understand how the heap works, as well as how malloc and free work with chunk allocations in tcache. A good blog post explaining this was written by Azeria, also known as Fox0x01 on Twitter. So I suggest you go and read her blog as she posts some amazing content. Either way, I'm still going to brief over some details of how the heap and chunks work. So, what is the heap? Simply, 
The heap is a region of memory that is not managed automatically for you, unlike the stack. It is more of a free-floating region of memory that gets allocated whenever you use the malloc function. Once you have allocated memory on the heap, you are then responsible for freeing that memory when it's no longer needed by calling the free function call. Within the heap, when we allocate data via malloc, the heap manager will find the memory region that is large enough to store the user data and internally allocate something called a chunk of memory. Now, this chunk of memory doesn't only store the user data, it actually stores much more than that. Heap Manager also needs to store metadata about the allocation alongside the user data and its requested size. And since chunks have to be 8-byte aligned on 32-bit systems or 16-byte aligned on 64-bit systems, the Heap Manager will allocate a chunk that is slightly larger than what the application or user initially asked for. Once the Heap Manager finds a chunk of memory large enough to store the user data, plus the metadata and alignment bytes, the heap manager then marks this chunk as allocated and returns a pointer to the aligned user data region inside the chunk, which the programmer sees as the return value of the malloc call. So, how do these allocated and free chunks look like? Let's start by looking at the allocated chunk. The allocated chunk can be broken up into three different sections. The first part of the allocated chunk contains the chunk size followed by the chunk flags, which usually make up the last three least significant bits of the chunk size header. There are three known flags that allocated chunks use, A, M, and P. The A flag dictates the allocated arena. This flag can be set to zero if the chunk comes from the main arena and the main heap, or it can be set to one if the chunk comes from M mapped memory. The M flag dictates if the allocated chunk is an M mapped chunk, meaning that it was allocated with the M map call and is not part of the heap. And finally, the P flag, which dictates if the previous chunk is in use. If this bit is set, then the previous chunk is still being used by the application and should not be considered as a candidate for coalescing, which is a merging of two adjacent free blocks of memory. Now, when the chunk is no longer needed, the free function call is made to free the allocated chunk and its data. While the free chunk looks similar to the allocated chunk, the user data is replaced with additional metadata. Like live allocations, these free chunks store the chunk size, the A and P flag fields, with M not being used, and they also contain pointers to other free chunks within the heap. There are two pointers in the metadata field, the forward pointer, and back pointer. Since these free chunks are stored in corresponding free bins that operate as linked lists, the heap manager uses these pointers to traverse between the free chunks when a new allocation is needed. You might also see free chunks storing additional size information for chunks before and after the current free chunk. This allows chunks to be traversed starting from any known chunk and in any direction and thereby enable very fast coalescing of adjacent free chunks. But these are only used for very large allocations, so let's not worry about these. Since we now understand the heap and its chunk allocations a little bit better, let's see the chunks in action within the binary. After executing our exploit again, let's create three new heap chunks of size 16 with random data. Once done, Let's attach GDB to our binary and view our heap. If we look into the heap chunks, you will see that our first 16-byte allocated chunk is stored at the following address. It is then followed by the two other 16-byte allocations. Now, if you remember the layout of the allocated chunks, before the user data, we have the chunk size and the three flag fields. In this case, the chunk size header is 0x21, or 33 in decimal. But why 33? Well, remember that this header stores the size of the user data, so 16 bytes. And since this is a 64-bit binary, we need a 16-byte alignment allocation. So 16 plus 16 equals 32 bytes. But we have 33 bytes. Why is that? 
Well, if you convert 0x21 to binary, we get the following. Remember that the three least significant bits of this value are the flags. So that makes the last three bytes the A, M, and P flags, respectively. Since the last value is 1, then we know that the P flag is set, marking that the previous chunk is in use, thus why we have 33 bytes and not 32. Cool. So we know how the chunks are structured in memory. But what happens if we free the second and third chunks? If we look back into the heap after freeing those chunks, we see the following. Notice how our first 16-byte allocation is still there, since we didn't free it. But our second and third chunks data is now totally different. These are the free chunk allocations. If we look at the second free chunk, we see that within the user data field, we now have a memory address. These are the back and forward pointers. The same applies to the third chunk. If we were to follow the backward pointer in the second chunk, then we will be taken to the top of the heap. And the first value that the backward pointer is pointing to is a value of 2, which is the total amount of free chunks available for a quick allocation, hence the two chunks that we just freed. If we look a few addresses lower, we see another pointer to the following address. If we follow this address, we see that we end up at our last free chunk. As stated before, these pointers are used by the heap manager for memory allocations of free chunks so that it can quickly just grab a free area and allocate it if the memory we requested will fit within the chunk's size. So, how can we use our one byte overflow to overflow the chunk header if there is padded lineman bytes? It's actually simple. We just need to find an allocation size that will allow us to write up to the next chunk size header. In this case, that size is 0xf8, or 248 bytes. Let's see how this looks like if we were to fill all 248 bytes of a chunk allocation along with the one byte overflow. First, we will restart our application. Then, we will rerun our exploit to get an interactive shell. Now, let's create two new allocations for 248 bytes and add some random data. If we look back into the heap, notice that the chunk size header are 0x101, or 254 bytes. 248 bytes is used for the size allocation, 8 bytes is the alignment padding, and 1 byte for the P flag. Now, let's go back and free the first chunk. Once we free that chunk, let's allocate a new chunk of size 248. But this time, let's write 249 bytes of data. If we view the heap again, you'll notice that our user data is full of 0x41, which is 8 in hex, and that the next chunk header isn't 0x101 anymore, but this time it's 0x141. So we successfully overwritten the chunk header. Now, what we could do from here is free the second chunk. And by freeing it, we will place it in the free list for chunks of size 0x138, or 312 bytes. As it is in the free list, it will be used to serve the next malloc of size 312. By allocating a new size of 312 and adding random data, we are now able to overflow many bytes into the other chunks, as seen right here. So how do we abuse this overflow? It's actually simple. To achieve arbitrary write, we'll update our exploit script to create three new chunk allocations of size 0xf8, or 248 bytes. Next, we'll free chunks 0 and 2, which allows us to target chunk 1 with our 1 byte overwrite. We then allocate a new chunk of size 0xf8, since this is the chunk that will be used to execute code when the system call is used, we will add sh followed by a null byte to execute a shell when we free this chunk. We'll then fill the rest of the allocation with a's and finally add x81 as our byte overwrite. This way, it will overwrite the second chunk size header to 0x181, 
which is 385 bytes of data. We then go ahead and free chunk 1, which adds the chunk to a free list for chunks of size 0x178 or 376 bytes. Next, we allocate a new chunk of size 0x178 and write 0x100 or 256 bytes of random data. We then follow that up with the free hook address. This will allow us to use our overflow primitive to overwrite the forward pointer of the second free chunk allocation with the pointer to free hook. Next, we will allocate a new chunk of size 0xf8 or 248 bytes and write junk data, which will force an overwrite of the back pointer. This way, we force the next malloc call to use the forward pointer and allocate data at the free hook address. This pointer change, which will be used by the heap manager for the next allocation, can be seen at the top of the heap. For us to get the system address pointer, we can do some simple offset calculations to get the base of libc and use that to find the system address. We can get the base of libc by using our leaked freehook address and subtracting it from the freehook offset in libc. Now, we can allocate a new chunk of size 0xf8 and write the system address to this buffer, which will overwrite the pointer that freehook is pointing to with a pointer to system, thus allowing us to execute arbitrary code anytime we free an allocated chunk. Once that's all in place, we free chunk 0. So, by continuing execution and gaining an interactive session, we can now execute arbitrary commands as seen. With a working exploit, we can now execute it against the server and read the flag. But there is just one problem. Our commands aren't executing. Why is that? Well, we need to make sure that we are using the same libc version as the server is. Otherwise, our offsets will be wrong. If you look at the offset of the libc leak on the server, we see that the freehook offset is 5a8. Looking this offset up in the libc database, we see that the offset matches four different libc libraries. I'm going to use the 2.29 AMD64 one. So let's download that replace the path in our exploit to use our newly downloaded libc, and kick off the exploit again. After a few seconds, we generate a new proof of work, gain an interactive session, and just like that, we can execute commands in the server. We now have a working exploit and can read the flag. Awesome.